Hey everyone, welcome back to DermCast. My name is Amber Blair, and today I have the great pleasure and opportunity to sit with someone very, very special. Dr. Jean Bologna, professor of dermatology at Yale University, has offered her time to take a few minutes to chat with us, and I couldn't be more excited. Thanks for coming and chatting with us today. My pleasure, dear. So, I don't know if all of our members know this quite yet, but you'll be giving two lectures for us at our Austin meeting. Can you just start by telling me a little bit about what you'll teach us? Sure. The first lecture, lecture that I'm going to be giving in the plenary session is about the many faces of lupus. And what I'll try to present is the clinical spectrum of how patients present, as well as some of the pitfalls in the differential diagnosis and the most appropriate way to evaluate the patient, be it through histology or the ordering of lab tests. In addition, I'll be explaining how a positive ANA does not equal lupus. One must look for other clues to the diagnosis. And sometimes, which is something that's a bit counterintuitive, you may meet a patient who has a low titer ANA and who has fatigue from depression, osteoarthritis and rosacea, but is holding dear to the diagnosis of lupus. And you may be the first person who tells them that they actually don't have lupus. So in addition to making a positive diagnosis, sometimes you have to break the news that what the rash is, is not lupus. So we'll be going over that as well. That's definitely a disease state that there are many intricacies to the diagnosis and clinical management of those patients. So I personally am very excited to get more of your insight on, on everything that goes along with treating our lupus patients. And I think because the skin is so important in the diagnosis, we really can't rely on rheumatologists to make the diagnosis of cutaneous lupus. That is really within the spectrum of the practice of dermatology. Absolutely. So there's a little teaser for that lecture. Can you now transition and tell me what else you'll be talking about at our conference? We'll also be giving a lecture on the mimickers of toxic epidermal necrolysis. And while you might say, well, TEN is fairly unusual, the main point of the lecture is that sometimes we look a little too close when we're making diagnoses and it's important to step back and look at patterns. And I use TEN as an example, but the main lesson is really about what I call a 4X examination of the skin. If you think about it, it's analogous to looking at a pathology slide. And that is that the dermatopathologist looks at 4X, 20X, and 100X. And oftentimes when we go into the room, we automatically go to a 20X examination of the skin. And with the advent of dermoscopy, we then move to 100X. But the hypothesis and the teaching that I'm trying to put forth is that as clinicians, we need to step back and look at the patient in a 4X way especially when it comes to a rash. And so I hope at the end of the lecture, people will say, oh, I'll go in, I'll be a 20X person. Maybe I'll use my dermatoscope, but if it's a rash, I'll step back, even literally step back, not just figuratively, and look at the patient's pattern of disease. So that's going to be the big lesson there. That's exciting and, and something that I learned very early on as well. Take a moment, take a step back, stop looking so close and look at the pattern and distribution. And sometimes you, you can see the forest through the trees then. Correct. And sometimes you basically do have to take a step back to force yourself to think that way and to take that moment of reflection. Yes. Absolutely. So we've got two exciting lectures and you know, for me personally, you know, you're the author of the you know, comprehensive textbook, or I 
think of it as the Bible of dermatology and just being able to take what we've all been reading and studying for so long and hear you talk about it personally um, is great. And we're so excited. Well, thank you. I was able to meet a number of the leaders of the organization at the booth they had at the American Academy of Dermatology recently held in Boston. And it was a very good start to a nice relationship. Excellent. We were very excited about it and talked about it on our board call, I promise you, when we all got back from the meeting. So from someone who has just an incredibly long list of accolades, I'm curious to know what's some of your favorite things or things that you're most proud of that you've done throughout your career? Well, of course, I'm most proud of the textbooks. And the reason is because I believe they're a great equalizer, meaning no matter where you are in the country or even where, no matter where you are in the world, if you're willing to put the time in to read and synthesize, you will know as much as anybody anywhere. And there was a time when access to information was really limited to, to high income countries, the United States, Western Europe, the UK. But I think now it's really universally available and it's about putting in the time and the energy and you don't have to feel like a second class citizen because you don't have a big library or you don't have a fancy school. It all has to do with what you put in to your learning because I've always believed that people should have a certain amount of knowledge be self-taught in sort of a Lincoln-esque type of way so that you aren't simply a clone of someone else but rather when you look at your teachers you say I took the best from this teacher and I took the best from this teacher and then I self-taught myself a lot of information and that's who I am and that's what I own um, as a practitioner. So that, that to me is, um, makes me feel good, especially when I meet somebody from a low income country who basically goes to the library and reads the book because um, they don't have enough money to own it, but yet they put the time and energy in and then they feel like they could take on anybody from the States based on knowledge. And so that, I think that's very heartwarming. I could not agree more. You're absolutely correct. And I'm very blessed to have you know, been in medicine at a time frame that there's no lack of access to information. Almost, almost the opposite, trying to organize right. the way that you take in information and places that you're getting it in a, in a fashion that you can keep your thoughts organized. But it's, I love it. It's everywhere and access is great. Well, I also think books can, if they're good, can give you a framework. What I talk about is the cake theory, which is that the book supplies the cake, but your experiences and seeing patients and what you learn on your own through PubMed, through reading is really the icing on the cake. But you always need a bit of a framework upon which to add new information because you don't want just random thoughts. I always think of medicine as in a sense an upside down tree meaning that a book should give you the big branches and then you add small branches and leaves. But I think if you just simply memorize leaves on the ground, it doesn't work because then nothing's intuitive. And I also think that when you think about a disease, you know a few key features, say a particular type of drug reaction, you know the two or three most common drugs and then you know where to look for the less common and rare. So you know where the table is, but in your head, you don't clutter it with everything that's uncommon and rare. You only have in your brain the common, where to look it up. And so I think that's also the function of a textbook is to give you, to be your friend basically, especially when you're tired <laughs> at the end of a long day. That's an excellent philosophy and a great starting point, I think, especially for newer practitioners that are trying to get their sort of feet under them, so to speak. It can be very overwhelming to try and memorize everything, but knowing where to go to look for the things is so important. Right. And I think, too, 
because there's so many diseases that people have never heard of in, in their regular school, be it PA school, nurse practitioner school, or medical school. They're really not prepared for those thousands of Latin diagnoses. And it gets very overwhelming very quickly. So I think that one thing by giving key features is that you get give someone a sense of confidence that if they only know two or three important things about a disease, okay, that's a good start. Uh, and it gives, I think you have to try to build confidence, especially that first year or two when you're trying to learn the vocabulary. Because for me, dermatology was really another foreign language and foreign languages were never my strong suit. Um, so I felt overwhelmed. You say foreign languages weren't your strong suit, but I did notice in your, your, my research in you that you've done quite a bit of international speaking and teaching as well. Yes, but only in English, my dear. <laughs> okay. There's a joke that if you can speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak two, you're bilingual. If, if you speak one, you're American. Okay, so. <laughs> I've taken many languages in my life, but I'm not good at any of them. So thank goodness for translators and the fact that most international meetings are now in English. So I was lucky that way. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about some of the international speaking that you've done. Well, I've been on most continents, I would have to say. Um, some of my favorite speaking was actually in the Regional uh, Training Center for Dermatology, which is in Moshi, Tanzania. And there they have a program where people who um, have done a little bit of medical work past high school can then go and train for two years in dermatology. So they're a dermatology trainee. They're not physicians. They're not necessarily nurses either. Some of them are nuns um, and they train for two years. And then they go back to their country of origin, basically English speaking countries in sub-Saharan Africa and assist in the care of patients with skin disease because in some of the countries there's only three or four dermatologists. And so they need extra help. But by going for two years, they really learn a lot of dermatology. And so that is supported by the International League Dermologic societies known as the ILDS. They're the ones that have the World Congress every four years. And then the monies that, it, that they make at the Congress, they then use to support this training center in Moshi, Tanzania. And so that's, that's really heartwarming because you see people doing an awful lot with, with not much in the way of, of therapies in the sense that they make their own sunscreen, they also can make their own corticosteroid creams, uh, but they make patients better by looking very carefully at the patient and thinking about the patient as opposed to running in and running out. Sometimes we get trapped that way and doing a biopsy and thinking the pathologist will tell you everything, you see. So it's, it's very very rewarding experience to do that. I would think that that would be incredibly fascinating to have that opportunity to participate in their lives in that capacity and incredibly rewarding. It was. Dr. Bologna, thank you so much for taking the opportunity to sit with us today. Your insight has been great. I'm so looking forward to seeing you at Austin at our conference. Again, my name is Amber Blair from Dermcast TV. Thanks for watching.